Welcome to Second Saturday Conversation, where we explore Christianity in and for the 21st century. We all know there is not one Christianity, and there never has been. But it's clear that Jesus and the early Jesus communities were in opposition to the violence and oppression and exploitations of empire. Jesus and the early followers of Jesus were anti-imperial. But that changed under Constantine, and our guest today might even suggest that it was Eusebius who provided uh, a legitimating narrative uh, for Christianity becoming the religion of the state. But over the centuries, as we know, Christianity has evolved and changed, and so has our understanding of scripture and Jesus and the kingdom of God and Christian identity. And today's topic is a case in point. So Christianity in the 21st century is problematic. And what Christianity might have to offer the 21st century is yet to be seen. And Second Saturday Conversation is part of that ongoing conversation. The, um, this year's uh, program title, sort of our overarching title for this year is Through a Glass Darkly, More Numerous of Windows, Superior for Doors. <laughs> and I draw that uh, first part, through a glass darkly, from a verse from 1 Corinthians. For now we see through a glass darkly, now we know only in part. Okay. And I have matched that, paired that with a poem by Emily Dickinson, which begins, I dwell in possibility, a fairer house than prose. She suggests that possibility is more akin to the poetic which is more numerous of windows, superior for doors than prose. We all know that rhetoric and language has the ability to shape our perceptions and our understandings of the world. Language has the power to move individuals and communities. And so much rhetoric today is coarse and aggressive. There is a fairer language to dwell in. So this year, I'll be referencing Emily Dickinson's poem as we talk about Christianity and the transformative power of language. But today, our topic is Christian nationalism. And it is worth noting, as we get underway, that patriotism and nationalism are two different things. In brief, patriotism is love of country. Nationalism is a fight for ethnic superiority. With the help of our esteemed guest today, Brandon Scott, we will learn about Christian nationalism, what it is, where it came from, what does it have to do with Christianity, why is it important that we get educated about it. But before we get underway, I want my friend and colleague Jeff Creswell to orient us a bit to the plenary time, which will follow Brandon's presentation. Uh, it'll be an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions of Brandon, um, make some comments of your own. So Jeff, would you orient us a bit to that? If you are here. Ah. Yep, there I am. I was having trouble getting unmuted. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, Marianne. Okay. Good morning. Hi, Hi, good morning. Thanks. And welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many familiar faces on the screen. I love this quilt. And um, so as Marianne said, I will help with um, facilitating the plenary, which is a time for you to ask questions, share your observations. Um, I'll also invite you to use the chat in the same way. So if you have something that arises as you hear Brandon speak um, and, and you wanna share that with the group, then put it in the chat and um, we often have a very lively conversation going on in the chat as well. When it's time for you to speak, if you have something you'd like to say, 
If you look at the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see um, React is one of the options. If you click on React, there's an option to raise your hand and a little hand will show up in the corner of your screen. And that will let me know that you would like to speak and I'll be calling on people um, as hands are raised. Please know that we don't always see them in the same order that you might see it on your screen. So if you think like you're the next in line, but you don't get called on next, that's just a, 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 a limitation of the technology. And when you do speak, it's very helpful if you have thought ahead about what you'd like to say so that you can keep your comment to about a minute. And we ask that so that with the hundreds of people who are here joining you, um, as many voices as can be heard is possible in the time that we have. So after that minute, I'll just keep track. And if you see me just put up a finger like that, that'll be me just letting you know that a minute's up. And so if you can complete your thought, that will give Brandon and Marianne a chance to respond so that we can then call on the next speaker. Thanks, Marianne. Hey, no, thank you, Jeff. That's great. Um, I mentioned in my invitation uh, for today um, that I had dismissed Christian nationalism. Uh, I didn't think it was Christian or American, or to put it more precisely, democratic. And I kind of crumbled up that narrative and tossed it in the garbage can. But I've come to learn that Christian nationalism is indeed something that we must take seriously. The rhetoric is not only intended to interpret Christianity, but to shape America. And Christian for Christian nationalism, there's really no divide between being a good American and being a Christian in the way that they see it. And I am now deeply concerned about Christian nationalism. And I want to give thanks to the West Star Institute that kind of uh, woke me up to this. Um, in May of this last year, 2024, they had a conference. Uh, they hosted a conference confronting Christian nationalism. And so over a period of several days, they addressed this issue. And I want to thank David Galston and Linda Hodges, who uh, make programming at West Star uh, so possible and available for us. I want to thank them because it was that conference that made me realize, well, wait a minute, Christian nationalism is not something to be dismissed. This is a disturbing uh, and important issue for all of us, okay? So um, I also encourage you to go to the westarinstitute.org, uh, check out their website. They have interviewed people and have a lot of references that I think will help us in our understanding of Christian nationalism. So here's cheers to Westar. I've asked Brandon Scott to be with us today. Um, he has studied Christian nationalism. He's an historian. Uh, he has a good ear for theology. He brings critical thinking to this topic, and he'll help us understand the implications of it. I mean, Brandon's voice is an important voice for our conversation. Um, Brandon um, hates introductions. And the last time I introduced Brandon here on Second Saturday, he said he didn't recognize himself. <laughs> So I will let the bio that we offered in the beginning in our opening slides uh, be sufficient introduction for Brandon. By the way, let me mention that we we also on our opening slides, I posted two really important um, quotes from Brandon that are from his blog, his Westar blog. Um, and uh, then there's a quote from Marcus, Marcus Borg. And we will send out those quotes to you in another week or 10 days so that those of you who were unable to read them have an opportunity to see them and maybe do some reflection on your own. So for all of you who have registered for today, you will get a copy of those quotes. Okay. Um, so even though uh, um, I will let our, our this is uh, this is Theo, um, my, my beloved uh, dog. Um, so in check, uh, if you go to Google Brandon Scott, let me just caution you. If you Google Brandon Scott, you'll come across the 52nd mayor of Baltimore, Maryland since 2020, who's a rising star in politics and a community leader and a public servant. Okay, And you'll also come across the Brandon Scott who appeared on My 600-Pound Life in season seven. 
And in a little over two years, Brandon Scott lost over 450 pounds. So if you want to know more about Brandon, Google Bernard or Bernard Brandon Scott, and you will learn more about our guest today. So I am so honored and uh, so pleased that Brandon can be with us. Um, I want Brandon to uh, go at this topic uh, however he would like, but um, I am hoping that he will also say a little bit about why this topic has caught his attention in the way it has. Indeed, what is Christian nationalism? What do they believe? What does it have to do with imperial theology and dominionism? How central is the white in Christian nationalism? And why, why should we be concerned as citizens, as human beings, even as Christians? So Brandon Scott, um, help educate us. Um, I am so glad that you are with us. And um, I look forward to this um, conversation, even as it is a difficult one. So um, Brandon Scott, there he is. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, what I want to do here is uh, kind of give a synopsis or a summary of what I think the issues are. Uh, and I want to begin with a kind of warning. I find this topic depressing, and I'm not a depressive type. I'm generally pretty cheerful and kind of bull my way through things. But <laughs> I, I have found this to be a very scary topic and a very depressing topic, Uh and so I just warn you in advance, you might want to tune out. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, here it is. Okay, let's make this work. All right, you, you might ask uh, why you should pay any attention to me on this topic, and that's a very fair question. I'm not an expert on Christian nationalism. Uh, my area of expertise is really the ancient world, primarily the first two centuries. I kind of wander up around the fourth once in a while when I get bored. <laughs> uh, but I have had a very long-term interest in American culture. One of my earliest books was on Hollywood dreams and biblical stories uh, about comparing biblical narratives to Hollywood myths and Hollywood pictures. I, in fact, I get credited sometimes was starting the whole genre of theology and film, uh, which I was never really interested in. I was more interested in mythology. but And I've kept that interest up. I published this summer a book on abortion. Uh, it's primarily a historical study of abortion from the ancient world up to today, up to the Alito decision, uh, which I think will go down with Dred Scott as one of the worst decisions in the history of the Supreme Court, although the Trump decision may well get that record. Uh, so I've had a long-term interest in this material, uh, but I don't want to pass myself off as an expert. I'm not an expert in sociology or American religion. I'm an interested bystander, so to speak, uh, and you'll have to take it for that. Christian nationalism is part of a, of a larger phenomenon. It's a part of a religious nationalism that is going on all around the world. Uh, Islamists are part of a religious nationalism. Viktor Orban in Hungary is probably the most famous example of one right now. He's really turned Hungary into a Christianist nationalist haven, and he's frequently on Fox News, and conservatives like to quote him. Uh, Christian nationalism won two elections in Poland, but they got defeated in the last one. Uh, Generally, once they get into office, they don't go out. So uh, Orban has perfected that. Uh, <clears throat> Narendra Modi in India, the BFP party in India, is a Hindu nationalist party. So, so this is a big movement. And, and there's both coordination going on internationally with these groups, and they all have their own kind of isolated differences. So it's, it's a kind of zeitgeist right now. Uh, one could argue that the current Israeli government is a Jewish nationalist party. Uh, certainly, the conservative uh, wing in it is Netanyahu is not religious at all, 
Uh, but that's one of the odd things about all these religious nationalism. The leader may not be religious at all, but his followers are very religious. And you see that in the Netanyahu government. And Vladimir Putin is a type of religious nationalist. He's uh, has very he is a nationalist, uh, and he has co-opted the uh, Greek Orthodox Church uh, into his program very strongly to the point that if you follow the the news in uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainians have had to go after the Orthodox Church because they have such strong ties to Russia. It's been a real problem for them. So this is a you ought not to think of this as simply American. It is a worldwide phenomenon. And they all have the same kind of reasons and causes, and there's a lot of similarities. So what are Christian nationalists? The first thing to notice about Christian nationalists is they identify as conservative. There aren't any liberal Christian nationalists. It is a very conservative movement uh, to the point that it's reactionary in many ways. But conservatism is a big part of its its appeal, and I'll come back. I'm going to come back to these points in a minute. I just want to get the issue out there. They blur the distinction between church and state, and they really think that this should be a Christian, probably Protestant nation. That is a very big part of what they are about. Um, they adhere to a literalist, fundamentalist view of the Bible, and in, and in some ways, you can say that Christian nationalism is simply the latest incarnation of fundamentalism. Fundamentalism has been constantly recreating itself over and over again. And this is maybe the latest avatar of it. Uh, they support an American imperial view, uh, which they identify with the kingdom of God. This is, this is really kind of important. Uh, th th this is critical at this point. These are their primary characteristics. Now, how many of them are there? This, I get this from the, there was PRRI, which is the Public Religion Research Institute. If you don't follow their website, you should. It's one of the best websites out there for data and good research about what's going on in religion and politics and culture in the United States. Very important. They did a study with the Brookings Institution on Christian nationalism and they determine this wheel here breaks it up. The adherents of Christian nationalism are about 10%. So they're not in and of themselves a big part of the American population, although in 10% in today's movement is a lot. The second group are the 19% who are sympathizers. These are people who basically agree, but don't identify, or they don't agree with all the points. So that gets you up to around 29% of the population uh, has some fairly strong adherence to this group. 4% don't score. They just, they don't care. Uh, that may have been Mary Ann uh, before she went to the West Star Institute. She would have been in the 4%. 29% are rejectors. They are people who are strongly opposed to the tenets of Christian nationalism. But there's a large group, 39% of the people who are skeptics. They're not sure about Christian nationalism, but they agree with some of its points. So they're, they're skeptical back and forth. Uh, if you look at this graph, you're looking at the American uh, election right now. Uh, the 4%, the 29%, and half of the 39% is Kamala Harris. The 10%, the 19%, and half of the 39% is Trump. So that's, they're fighting over that 30, those people in that 39%. That is actually as good a summary of what's going on in the, in the election as you can get right there. So that, that 39% is people who are up to vote. They could slip strongly towards the rejectors or they could begin to move towards the sympathizers. They're really open for movement. Now, I want to go back and look at the criteria quickly here. Christian, national, uh, Christian nationalists identify as conservative. Um, conservatism was really born as a reaction to the Enlightenment. Uh, conservatism gets started in England, uh, reacting to both the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. 
and Burke, who was its founder, was opposed to rights. Conservatives don't really believe in rights. The, the Enlightenment changed reality in a fundamental way. We, we think differently before and after the Enlightenment. After the, the Enlightenment gave each individual equal rights. That's kind of the fundamental principle of the Enlightenment. Conservatives reject that notion. They think they're entitled to what's theirs, what Burke called the patrimony. The Englishman didn't need rights. He had property and inheritance. And that's, that's still a big part of the conservative idea, that they are entitled, they are the ones who should run the country, it's their country, and they resent, and resentment is an important part of conservatism, they resent allowing these outsiders in. Uh, so therefore, they, t they, they really tend towards a kind of single view, a nativist view of the country, of the nation, uh, and they and it's very hard to get them to move for, away from that sense of entitlement. Um, even you know when American conservatism was reinvented under Goldwater and William F. Buckley, you know they built it on resistance to segregation. That was the Buckley's fundamental insight that the South could be taken away from the Democrats by supporting them on segregation. And so he opposed the Brown versus the Board of Education very strongly. Uh, the first article, one of the first articles in his new journal, The New Republic, was uh, "The South Must Win," uh, and he, he was very strong on that point. Ronald Reagan opened his presidential bid in Mississippi, not an accident, not the natural place. So conservatives really have a sense of entitlement that this belongs to us, and we, we should not be forced to share it with these other, these newcomers. They blur the distinction between church and state, and that America should be a Christian nation. Um, this is one that falls from their conservatism and from their religion. Um, the, the, the American Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are Enlightenment documents. The Declaration, the Constitution begins, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. There's no mention of God in the Constitution. All power comes from the people. That is, that's an Enlightenment position. Um, they don't believe that. They believe that all power comes from God and therefore, that the nation should follow God's law. Uh, and this is a problem where, where you can go into most congregations, even liberal congregations, and you start to ask them, is Chris, should this be a Christian nation? Well, no. But should we follow God's law? Well, yes, because we get caught up on this, because we really haven't thought through exactly what the relationship is between our personal religion and the state. So, so we're very vulnerable on this topic. It's a, it's a, it is a very tough issue for most people. I put this up here. This is from PRRI from a recent study they did. Uh, the U.S. government should declare America a Christian nation. Notice that 50% of all Americans agree with that statement. Among the adherents, it's 75%. So 50% means that the population is very vulnerable to that, to, to, to that topic. That's, you can get to a majority here fairly quickly. Uh, U.S. law should be based on Christian values. Only 39% of the population agrees with that. 81% of the adherents to Christian nationalism agree with that statement. So you can see that the first one is really the stronger one, that we should be a, declare ourselves a Christian nation. Uh, Trump has been big on this, by the way, uh, and J.D. Vance is in this camp. Being Christian is truly an important part of being an American. 46% of Americans agree with that statement. That's, that's a high number. That's almost as high as we should be declared a Christian nation. 
77% of adherents. God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. This is the one that gets the highest vote. 54% of Americans agree with that statement. That's, that's a lot. That's, that's a concern. Actually, the adherents <laughs> have less at that point. So it's, that's one that really is kind of interesting. All righty. They adhere to a literalist, fundamentalist view of the Bible. Uh, fundamentalism is an American creation. We made it up. Uh, and it, it has a kind of complicated history. Uh, actually, the, the Wikipedia article on, on this is very good. If you want to just put fundamentalist in and go to Wikipedia and you'll see a very good article. Fundamentalism gets started as a rejection to enlightenment again. So the enlightenment is the key to a lot of these things. Fundamentalists are rejecting a historical understanding of the Bible. It is literally the word of God, and it's not subject to historical criticism. In fact, it's ahistorical in their view. It is revelation. Um, and and this, this peculiar view has been imparted to the rest of the world. Islamists are not nationally fundamentalist, but they have become fundamentalists under the influence of Christian missionaries. That's how it got into the Middle East uh, in odd sorts of ways. And it's gotten into the American legal system. We have a kind of fundamentalist interpretation of law. The originalism or textualism is, a, is the same kind of thing that, that you find in Protestant fundamentalism. So they're really devoted to this. Um, and they support an American imperial view in which they uh, in which they identify with the kingdom of God, idealize it as the kingdom of God. Uh, this is a very interesting one. You would think that a movement was founded by somebody who was executed by the state would be kind of hesitant to think about imperialism. And early Christianity, up until the time of Constantine, really was an anti-imperialist movement. Uh, you can see it all over the place, and, and largely because they rejected the values of the empire. Jesus was crucified, executed. Um, it's, it's a shame that the cross has become a piece of jewelry because it it's, it's really should be a horror. Um, I used to tell my students instead of wearing a cross, they should wear a hypodermic needle because that's how they execute people in Oklahoma. Uh, it might make more sense. But when, when Constantine began to favor Christianity and made the league and religion legal, he didn't make it the official religion. That came late, a little bit later. But he made it legal. The bishops did not know what to do. They thought this, this conflict with the empire was eternal. That God was opposed to the empire. That was a fundamental part of Christianity. And the reason why it kept getting into trouble. Eusebius, uh, in his church history, uh, he invented a way to combine the imperial view and the Christian view. And he basically used the Old Testament as his model, Moses, and he, he identified Constantine as the new Moses. God had sent him to defeat the empire, create a new Christian empire, and this was really God's will. He almost deals with, with Constantine as the second Messiah, uh, as the completion of the Messianic movement. And what, what Eusebius does in a, in a really brilliant way is identify imperial power with church power. And that remained in place from Eusebius in the fourth century up until, you know, <clears throat> up until the French Revolution. Uh, and it, it has remained a goal of many, many people. Um, I was raised in a Roman Catholic tradition. Uh, and there was a heresy called Americanism. That heresy was condemned because some American bishops 
thought Catholics should cooperate with the state, that it was good, and separation of church and state was a good thing. And that was condemned under Pius X, who said, no, we should oppose it. If we can get good things out of it, okay, but we, you know, Catholicism should be in charge. That was not officially set aside until Vatican II in the 1960s. So this, this notion is, is very deep in Christianity. This is a major, major plank in Christian nationalism that they think they are entitled to run the country, that God has given them dominion. You see this sometimes under dominion theology, has given them dominion over all the, all the peoples, all, over all the country. Now, there's some interesting characteristics here. First of all, Christian nationalism is a rejection of the Enlightenment. Uh, and it, it rejects science and it rejects pluralism. It, it uses a lot of the blood language that comes out of fascism. I don't think it's quite fascist in the same sense, uh, but it does use a lot of that, that language. And this is why you get all the stuff against immigrants. Immigrants are the other who are sullying the pure blood of the country. Uh, and it, it's a major, major issue. Religion here, American religion, Christianity, is part of the problem because it has never come quite clean on its relationship to the Enlightenment. Uh, too many Christians uh, still hold on to parts of, of pre-Enlightenment thinking. And we've never had a clean, a clean break on this, um, I think. It understands itself as a white nation. Now, sometimes it's careful about this because um, it's not polite in public society to be anti-Black or anti-Asian. But I, I would suspect that when this election is over and the the studies start to come out, we'll see that one of Kamala Harris's major problems was she was a female, she was black, and she was Asian. And that that is a, probably a much bigger issue uh, than people are recognizing. Uh, but they Christian nationalists recognize a white race, nation. They also understand it to be a Christian nation. I mean, these things are all tied together. Uh, now, you say, okay, they're just 10% of the population. What chance do they have of getting this done? Oh, pardon me. One more thing. This is what makes it work. The whole thing is built upon anxiety at the loss of status. Uh, conservatism thinks we are entitled, and it should be the way it was, and conservatives are consciously anxious that they're losing their status to somebody else. The white nation is scared of blacks and immigrants and browns taking over. The Christian nation is, is built upon, it should be run by Christians, not Jews or Islam or whatever it is. You know, the, the, you get this constant figuring. It, <clears throat> And all of that fuels a sense of anxiety because we're losing our status. Uh, many studies have shown that the, that the bonding factor between Trump and his strong base is their anxiety over their loss of status. They feel like they are dis disrespected by the elites, that blacks are taking things away from them. Uh, and he feeds that. He, he really feeds that anxiety. And that anxiety is kind of the perfect mix for a reactionary movement. It's just <laughs> on steroids. Now, I want you to look at this chart. Uh, this was from a recent PRRI study. It's a really excellent study on their annual report on the status of religion in America. Uh, if you look at the trend lines here, the purple line, um, are religiously unaffiliated. Notice in 2006, it starts at 16%, and now it's at 26.8%. Uh, 
It's the only trend line going up. And it's going to continue to go up. And when the older folks die off in this country, the line is going to shoot through the <clears throat> through the roof. Uh, we are beginning to look a lot like Europe and Canada. Uh, Europe followed this trend line in the 1950s and 60s, and Canada followed it in the 70s and 80s, and we started it around 2000. So we're headed in that direction, and there's probably no way to reverse it. The other trend lines are kind of interesting. The Catholic trend line is the one on the bottom. It's white Catholics. And notice it's dropped from 16% to 12.6%. It's, it's really kind of plateauing. The evangelical line, this is one of the things that scares evangelicals. In 2006, they were 23% of the population. In 2022, they were 13.6% of the population. So they are in decline and serious decline. But they're having trouble with their youth is the, is the biggest problem. And some women, women. White mainline Protestants, by the way, were at 17.8 and now are at 13.6. They're actually kind of flat and they might be just kind of moving around. They're not declining Hardly at all. It's, it's, that's actually pretty good news for them. They've kind of resisted it. When you look at that, uh, and you think about the first graph we looked at, this is probably the last election in which the white conservative vote has a chance to win. Um, because of low percentage of American voters, and because the, the way the, uh, our voting system is arranged, Democrats have to win about 4% ahead in the majority vote to, to carry an election. So you can easily win with a minority. 48% of the vote can win. But if you look at this graph, you can see this is what's referred to among sociologists as the Repo Republican problem, their population is dying uh, and it's disappearing. So this may be the last one where they can win in a free election. After that, the demographics are gonna be slanting too much in the wrong direction. If they win it, they have a platform in place that we will not have any more elections. I think that's, a, you have to think about that. That is the goal of Christian nationalism. Um, now, you know, these talks are supposed to end with some cheery point. I don't have a cheery point. I, I think the demographics look really hard uh, on this election. And it's going to be very difficult uh, to defeat the Christian nationalists. J.D. Vance is a Christian nationalist, uh, explicitly. So Trump appeals to him strongly. He really knows how to appeal to him. And he's, he has frankly been a genius at playing off their anxiety. He has, he has really mastered. He has never tried to expand his base. He's just tried to, to mass that group. And he's been very good at it. He's done a very successful job at it. So I tried to keep this short so that we would have plenty of time uh, to talk. Wow. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Um, before we open it, oh, people are already, of course, uh, lots to say. Um, let me ask you a question um, about um, the masculinization of Christianity. Um, do you think that that also is playing into, um, that that's at work here too, um, with this notion of, you know, 
the headship of the male and all of that. So yeah. do you have any comment about the hyper masculinization of Christianity and Christian nationalism? Yeah, I, I don't like the word hyper because I don't quite know what, what we're hyping. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But for me, patriarchy, I mean, I think you have, you have two fundamental kind of models here. One is patriarchy, which has been the traditional model. Uh, or you have all people are equal. That's the two options. Okay, so again, you're back to the Enlightenment. Everything comes back to the Enlightenment. I don't think people realize how important the Enlightenment was. It has really changed everything. And we're still fighting it, that battle. You know, we're not out of the woods on it. Um, so hyper-masculinity, I don't think is the issue. I think patriarchy is the issue. Okay. Should should we be equal? Is everybody equal? Or should men rule? There's a lot of people who think men should rule. Uh, the Supreme Court does. The majority of the Supreme Court is firmly in this position. The Roman Catholic Church is, not a doubt. Uh, I have great admiration for Francis, but he's a patriarch. He does not understand feminism at all. He doesn't get it. And he's not going to get it. It's not, not going to happen. Uh, I, we were talking before we kind of went live. That I, for example, won't say the Lord's Prayer because I'm not into master slaves. The Lord's Prayer, that kurios means master. If there's a master, there's a slave. That, that's the way the model works. So I'm just not into slavery. You know, we fought, a, we had a civil war about this. My ancestors were actually on both sides, <clears throat> but my one the of the South were wrong. I mean, you know, it's, so I, I will not use language. It, church refers to masters or Lord. I don't use that language. It's not appropriate, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how many churches use that language. It's used all the time. We don't even think about it. But that inculcates into us a sense that God is the master, we're the slave. Jesus is the master, we're the slave. No, you have to rethink all that. And that's hard. One of the, one of the problems here, I think, in all of this discussion is critical thought is hard. Patriarchy is easy. You just do what we've always done. But really rethinking things, once you start rethinking things, lots has to go. And that that is a tough, that's a tough sell. That is a very tough sell. So I think I agree, I think masculinity is at, at the core of this. Patriarchy is the core of this. Um, they don't they don't hype on it very much. Trump does. He really plays an explicitly masculine card. Uh, Kamala Harris, to me, does not hype as much as she should on the fact that she's a woman. But she might be thinking it didn't work for Hillary Clinton, and maybe she shouldn't do it. I don't know. I'm not a political analyst. But uh, it's a major issue, and it underlies a lot of this. And that's part, I think you have to always keep in mind this loss, this sense of loss, the anxiety created by the loss of status. That's what many males feel. That, I mean, I know many academics who are theoretically liberal, quite liberal, but are kind of angry and anxious that women are getting all the jobs. <sighs> so anxiety can creep in very easily. And when it does, it becomes a powerful motivating force. It's, it's I, I mean, one of the things my wife and I talk about is I belong to that school of political thought that believes fear sells better than love. Mm -hmm. And um, you need to think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, Do people come to church because they love for love or do they come there because they're afraid they'll go to hell? Yeah. Uh, Carlson P Pearson, who was a, lived here in Tulsa, he was uh very prominent evangelical. And he suddenly started taking the Bible seriously and realized he didn't think there was a hell and that God wasn't going to condemn everybody. 
and they read him out. And I remember telling me one time, you know, it's been very hard raising money when he tells everybody God loves them. He can raise a lot more money when he tells God he's going to send you to hell. So, I mean, that's yeah. something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. thank you for that. I think that that fear piece and nostalgia, yes. is, that those two things work. And well. nostalgia creates anxiety mm -hmm. for what's lost mm -hmm. and what we are entitled to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I also want to make a note, and then we'll go to the um, uh, other folks. Um, I think it's 2042 now, where whites will be in the minority. Yeah. In this country. And I think that this also supports what you're saying about um, that the time for white um, uh, you know, supremacy, if you will, is... Um, short i think if you look at the at the charts i mean for the for this kind of christian nationalist policy to win they're going to have to change the rules and victor orban showed them how to do it uh -huh. um and you know the, the supreme court has opened up the possibility that an American president can shoot his political rival, uh, that didn't, they didn't blanch at that. I don't, you know, for originalists, I think George Washington would have turned over in his grave, but, um, you know, that the, the guidelines aren't in place. You had a majority of Republicans in the last House who voted against certification of the election. So, you know, do I think the government will become authoritarian if Donald Trump wins? Yeah, I think it will. How seriously authoritarian? I don't know. I don't have a magic, I'm, I have no magic ball. I'm trained to look firmly into the past. <laughs> um, but the past is not, you know, People think you cannot lose democracy. The greatest democracy in the ancient world was Athens and it lost it. Mm -hmm. It lost it, it gave it up for its empire. Uh -huh. Okay. Fear is a powerful motivator. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to, um... I want to uh, invite others for comments and so forth, but let me just very quickly, and because there may be some people new to us, I'm going to very quickly read through some listening guidelines that we use here on Second Saturday. This is our kind of uh, hospitality, if you will, when in listening and in speaking. So I'm just going to go through these really uh, quickly because these this is sort of the... Um, this is our understanding in our conversations, to, to take time to become just settled. Uh, listen to others with your entire self, your senses, your feelings, your intuition, imagination, rational faculties. Don't interrupt. Pause between speakers to absorb what's been said. So take a breath before the next person speaks. Don't formulate what you want to say while someone else is speaking. I mean, that's like talking over them. <laughs> um, speak for yourself only. Express your own thoughts and feelings. Refer to your own experiences. Avoid being hypothetical. I know this is not easy. Steer away from broad generalizations. Don't challenge what others say. Listen to the group as a whole, to those who have not spoken aloud as well as to those who have. Generally leave space for anyone who might want to speak a first time before speaking a second time. And, and this one is, is quite hard, certainly is for me sometimes. Hold your desires and opinions, even your convictions, lightly. So um, in our conversation today, we just want to be um, uh, good listeners and, and also know that we can uh, speak our, our hearts and concerns. So Jeff, do you wanna uh, help to get us underway with plenary time? Yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you, Brandon. I I was just this morning talk about synchronicity reading an article in The Guardian 
Millionaire Apostle Summoning Women to D.C. for Christian Nationalist Rally. And this woman, Jenny Donnelly, who's the leader of an anti-trans Don't Mess With Our Kids, to host a first of a series of pre-election gatherings in Washington, D.C. She's trying to gather a million women, uh, white women, um, on, on the National Mall to um, pray and fast for our country. And she claims that, um, that she can get that many women, and she has chosen um, Yom Kippur as the day to start this. So I, I share I share your sense of doom. I, I don't uh, I want to be clear. I don't have a sense of doom. I think this election is extremely close. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think Kamala Harris has a good chance to pull it out. I think Trump has a good chance to pull it out. Uh, yeah. I live in Oklahoma. You know, my kids live in Oregon. They don't get it. <laughs> you don't live in the real world out there well in <laughs> interestingly uh, this jenny donnelly lives in portland oregon oh yeah my. it's they're there but i mean um i don't have a sense of doom i just find it um uh, i find it depressing and the reason i want to say clearly why i find it depressing and i'm not a depressive type i think marianne will tell you i'm i'm really not i'm yeah, yeah. If anything, it's a joy to be with. <laughs> one of my uh, favorites. <laughs> but I, I find it depressing because one, you can't make an appeal to science. They're anti-science. So yeah. science proves, <laughs> you know, they they can't listen to it. They won't listen to it because they're they're already convinced it's wrong. Secondly, this is really important. They have the tradition on their sides. They can point to plenty of things on the tradition that agrees with their position. Yeah. If you're taking a critical position, you can point to plenty of things too, but you got to make an argument and you have to be critical. That's difficult. People don't want to think. I mean, I spent my whole life teaching. I love teaching. I loved my students, but only 10% were willing to think. The rest of them just wanted to be told the answer. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I couldn't understand. These people wanted to be ministers and they weren't excited about learning Greek and, and what this text actually had to say. No, just tell me what I have to preach. It was like, what? I, I, just, I could never get that through my head. Yeah. But but that, if you have to make a critical argument, you, you're, you're pushing it uphill. And we do have to make a critical argument. And yeah. third, I, I get depressed because it's easy to appeal to people's fear. And if you have somebody who's just truth has no value, you can create fear everywhere. Yeah. And that's what depresses me. I don't, I, I, you know, I just find it, it's, it's a really uphill slog. Uh, yeah. And it won't end even if Kamala Harris wins the election. JD right. Vance will be the yes. next yes. nomination or somebody worse. Yeah. Sorry, Thanks. I didn't mean to go on. No, no, I, I think that's important. we're supposed to hold our convictions lightly. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not any good at that at all. I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm terrible at number 10 myself. So yeah. <laughs> But I think your point about critical argue, critical thinking is really important because argumentation, I don't know that we can, uh, well, that, that, that's sort of another topic, but, you know, how can we argue this? Um, I think I think you're right. It's an uphill. Um, and getting in the public debate with a critical argument is difficult. Yes. Really yeah. difficult. Yeah. 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 Yes. So um, one other thing I just want to note, and it may come up in the questions, is that, you know, my read on Christian nationalism is also that they're sort of anti-diversity. Oh, sure. Which is anti-democratic. And they're anti-diversity they, because they're only white. Yes. And all this LGBTQ stuff, all, all of that, it's it's not 
black and white. It's, you know, it's good and evil. It's, I mean, that all blurs a lot of distinctions. Yeah. And I think that that also is a, a real um, touching point for Christian nationalism. You have to be clear about the LBQ thing. There are opposed to it because it destroys maleness. Okay. It defines, I mean, the patriarchy needs a definition of male, it needs a simple definition. The male is the master, the female is the slave. If you complicate gender, <laughs> The whole thing falls apart. I mean, I used to, gay men are just an affront to a strong heterosexual who hasn't dealt with that kind of stuff because it says gender is not natural. It's modifiable. Well, that scares the shit out of me. I'm sorry, I guess I shouldn't use shit, but it really scares them, you know? It's, <laughs> and if you've got any insecurity about your sexuality, your anxiety, Pops up real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So are we ready to open up the plenary? Yes. Again? Yes. I think that's... Great. Um, just a, a quick reminder, when I call on you, if you would unmute yourself, and then um, you'll have about a minute to um, express your comment or your question for Brandon or Marianne. And I'll let you know if that um, minute is... Um, up just so that you can wind up and we can give more people an opportunity. And let's start with you, Jim High. Welcome back. <laughs> well, I've gotten unmute. I'm still having to use my iPhone. Oh, hope, hope it's working. It I is have working. Just some comments I want to make right quick so people understand me. <laughs> um, about 40 years ago, I walked away from the organized church because I uh, before Bishop Spawn came along, I had realized that it was unbelievable, which was the title of his last book. The next thing I want to say is that I've taken a, a great interest in studying spirituality, and I love Buddhism. Not that I'm a Buddhist, but I love Buddhism. And I, I think that we need to learn as a people, as a whole people, now this is the whole population of the planet, to live in the reality that exists. The church is trying to make us continue to live in the reality of 2,000 years ago, and that's gone. And the last thing I want to say is if anybody in the crowd hadn't watched Bad Faith, the documentary Bad Faith, that will explain to you how Christian nationalism is not just Donald Trump. It started 20 years ago, and it tells you all about it, and it is very, very dangerous. It's a wonderful documentary. If you have prime video you can get it free there's several other places that show it you can google bad faith and find it on the internet and watch it with ads but please go watch bad faith and you'll understand christian nationalism yeah. thanks thank you for listening thank yeah, you thanks Jim. and god and country is another important documentary too yes i, I know i'm get, going to get to that one soon yeah <laughs> great just one quick point yep. it's not two thousand years ago Okay, it's much more recent. Well, whenever the church started, no, but I think that's important to point because you, when you say two thousand years, you grant them their argument that they are standing in the tradition and they can claim the whole thing. That's bucks. It's not true. Well, that's why it's not it's true. Not that's true. why they're trying for, to. For put Christian you that. nationalists, their golden period has never happened. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So it's yeah. complete fantasy, but that requires a critical argument. And 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 I'm not trying to pick on you because I love you, Jim, but I love you too. it's <laughs> not 2,000 years. That grants <laughs> them the argument. I don't want to give them the argument. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Mary Larson. Mary, do you want to turn on your video and your and unmute yourself? Are you there, Mary? Or at least unmute. Yeah. No, we'll come back to Mary. David Coombs. David, do you want to unmute? Thank, Thank you. Sir. Hi, Brian. And good to uh I'm David Coombs. I uh live in Danville, California. I attend the San Ramon Valley United Methodist Church. 
January, I gave a began a 11 week Jesus in America course on the history of Christianity, covering the five what I call five spiritual awakenings. And Brandon, I think the third awakening post Civil War laid the groundwork for where we are: science, religion, social gospel, biblical criticism, fundamentalism, all in that 30 year period. I left. I I was allowed by my pastor to uh, hey, give you a were sermon. Allowed by your pastor, I was my pastor. Think about my that pastor, That means my, he's the master. You're the slave. My pastor. Oh, you're my sheep. pastor. I, I don't no, go to churches Brandon, where I'm sheep. Stop it. Stop it. My Brant. My pastor said, "David, you can say the things I cannot say." And so I gave a Cliff Notes version and a sermon in June, and I left my congregation with a proposition that this fifth awakening was a choice between Christian nationalism and the path to what Mike had said, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And so my congregation, I think, understands it, and I'm reteaching the class beginning on Monday. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm. You're quite right about the period after the Civil War. In America, the reaction is not to the Enlightenment. In fact, Americans were very much pro-Enlightenment uh, up until the Civil War. I mean, our Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, is a very Enlightenment document. Uh, more problematic in the South, <laughs> they didn't quite get along with the Constitution and didn't quite get along <clears throat> with the Enlightenment part, which is why we ended up with the Civil War. But the real reaction is Darwin. In America, the Enlightenment, what what in Europe, the, the reactions to the French Revolution and the philosophies, in America, it comes later. We seem to do everything about 100 years later. <laughs> uh, it's after Darwin. It's the reaction to Darwin. You're absolutely, absolutely. right on that. That is the critical point. That was the one that drove the pincer through. You're right. You and have the Schofield that's Bible. Think, yeah. That's why Lyman I think Moody. fundamentalism Christian nationalism is just the latest avatar of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. And and it's it is. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, and then we have David Depew. David, can you unmute? Uh, I thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, two points that I was hoping you could comment on. One of them is that um, we've had Christian nationalism surges in the United States uh, before. And it seems to happen when immigration is perceived by the majority white uh, population as a little out of control. So you had the know nothings uh, against the Irish Catholics before the Civil War. And then um, in the early 20th century, after all that immigration, you had the uh, second revival, they had the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, uh, so I presume that, and I noticed that historically, these things calm down when people are more integrated into the society, when when it becomes more tolerant. So that's the hopeful thing. We could do that now because we're in another one of those moments where immigration um, seems to be, um, to the majority, um, out of control. So that's an important theme that I think we haven't talked about yet. But my second theme is <laughs> uh, 50... Um, in the 1950s, when I grew up and Kennedy was uh, was elected, uh, the the claim of American democracy was for religious pluralism. But in the 1980s, Protestant theologians invented the notion that secular humanism is an anti-religious value, and that all the people, like in universities, are secular humanists, and that they don't have any values at all. And therefore, the situation is a little different than it was before, because it looks like uh, you could even get uh, Catholics who are not, by nature, religious um, national, uh, Christian nationalists. It's an international religion. Uh, you could get them to vote for your um, nationalist candidate by pulling this uh, secular humanist uh, card on them. Yeah. Um... On the Catholic issue, they are quite susceptible to it. Catholicism has a long history of authoritarianism. In fact, it's an authoritarian religion. Okay, they, they only 
the only absolute monarch left is the Pope. Right. Okay, so you need to kind of always remember that. And Vatican II was, that's pretty late, the 1960s. There's a movement called Intercalism uh, that's very strong in, in very conservative Catholic circles, of which Vance is a part, he's an intercalist, wow. uh, that believes that Catholicism is the dominant religion and should set the morals and the standards of the state. So Catholics are very susceptible to this. Not all, <clears throat> many aren't, but but there is a group that are, and, and it's deeply embedded in Catholicism. A considerable number of the American bishops are intercalists, uh, especially yeah. the ones appointed by JP2. Yeah. Uh, so on that side, the, the first one was what I, I wanted to say about that too. The, but it's driven by waves of immigration. Yeah. Movement. We've had these over and over again, and they do tend to subside. But I, th I think the, the issue to think about here is um, one of the things that's really different is we're probably, because of global warming, going to face massive immigration issues all around the world. So it's not going to end. Those other immigrations, you know, when the when the plague stopped in Ireland, the Irish kept quit coming, and the same thing happened in Germany and Eastern Poland. That you know, those waves came because of things that were happening in those countries. But that when that quit, then the waves subsided. This is not going to subside. It's going to mm -hmm. get worse and worse. We're we're at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, if you look at the studies on this, it's just you know. Large parts of the earth are going to be uninhabitable, and those people are going to move. So they're going to move this direction. So that's that's going to be a continuing issue to deal with, and we are not we're not even talking about it. We don't even we don't even have the agenda on our seriously on our plate. The church could be leaders here, but it's not been. Mm -hmm. So the other thing too is they've also been solved by rising economies. Um. Mm -hmm. I suspect our economy will rise, but how fast? That's a question. Yeah. The third thing to think about is, which I, you know, it shows you how far the Republican Party has come from its business group. Business is pro-immigration. Business knows we need immigrant immigrants. We can't support the society if we don't have a lot of immigrants. We need a lot of immigrants. So, and we're capable of absorbing them. So it's a, this one, this, I think you're quite right to point to it. We have gone through this before. The dynamics are very similar, but there are also some issues in play that make it a little scarier too. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Nice to see you, David. Yeah. And uh, Jane, can you unmute? Thank you, Jane. Down in the lower left-hand corner. There you go. Um, hi, uh, my name is Jane Everett, and my question is: How can mainline churches really mobilize their congregations against Christian nationalism? I live in Colorado, that's a blue state, and you know things are okay. Except, for example, we have a ballot initiative to put the right of school choice in the Constitution. Right now, we have school choice for public school, but this would include private, including religious, homeschool. And I know that Arizona and Oklahoma are really um, in real trouble budget-wise because of the incredible cost of paying people to go to private schools mostly people who were already going to private schools <laughs> so i have no idea how the mainline church can mobilize anything the last time the mainline churches tried to mobilize anything was civil rights right. and they took a beating and i think they probably decided never to do it again okay so i, I don't know I, I would love to be proved wrong on that but i i don't i think the only, it may be because I live in Oklahoma, but I read the national newspapers pretty carefully. I don't hear the mainline churches saying much. They're actually in a 
little uptick in growth. They're not dropping like the fundamentals are. The fun, um, the evangelicals have fallen through the through the floor. They're really scared. In fact, if you read the evangelical press, they're looking to Trump to put them in charge. They think they will be back in charge when Trump wins. That's really a big part of their support. But the main lines have just gone quiet. I don't. I have no idea what they're saying. They're certainly not breaking through. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Jill. I like Jill. I said, I'm not a prophet. You know, I, I'm a historian. I look to the past. Huh. Uh, yes, a couple of comments. Uh, you mentioned this fear of immigration. I remember reading that back in Pennsylvania in the 1700s, early 1700s, there were all papers out decrying German Im Im immigration to Pennsylvania because there were all these German newspapers and they thought that was going to destroy the English society. So I, I think it's been with us for a long time. And the other thing about Trump, I don't think Trump is a Christian nationalist. He's using Christian nationalists because I remember uh, watching Howard Stern at one time back in the 90s, you know, Cam Kamala was recently on Howard Stern, but Howard Stern interviewed Trump and he said, you're a Democrat. Now, have you ever thought of running for public office? He said, no. Well, if you ran for president, he said, would you run as a Democrat? And Trump said, no, I would run as a Republican because they'll believe anything I say. They're the <laughs> dumbest group. And so, you know, I, I think Trump, is someone who knows how to use people for his own ends. And he is greatly enamored by the power of Putin and the people in Hung the head of Hungary, China. So I, I, I hate to call him a Christian nationalist because I see nothing Christian about him. So- uh, I, I don't think he's a Christian nationalist either. Okay. Uh, he's certainly a nationalist. He's a nativist, uh, and he is—he loves Christians. I mean, you, you hear it, it's, it's its a standard saying in stump. If, if if you haven't listened to his stump speech, you really should. It's, you'll be wasting two hours. But the newspapers don't do him justice. They yeah. really make him sound a lot more rational than he is. But he's big on the on the—he's not a Christian at all. But he claims to be a believer now, and. Going on. But the, Victor Orban's the same way, you know, yeah. and and the last prime minister of, of Poland was the same way, and Netanyahu. So it's these people don't need their leader to be one of them. They just need to have power. So I think that's. I would also point out that immigrants have always been the other. Mm -hmm. That that is deep. You read the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. There are this this phrase recurs over and over again. There are three groups that need special protection from Yahweh. They're always in the Yahwistic text. It's widows, orphans, and immigrants. Because yeah. they have no protection. Society has has cut them apart. So that goes back forever. It's it, it they are an easy target because they don't belong. That's the whole point. Well, also in the Old Testament, they say something about remember that you were once slaves in a foreign land so you yeah. should treat the you know the other person with kindness yes exactly yeah yeah we're thank not you doing a good job with that but again to make that argument you got to make a critical argument you got to go back and recover the text put it in its historical context think about what it's saying yeah 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 you got the hard one he's got the easy one get him out of here yeah yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jill. Thanks. Um, Peggy Matthews. Peggy, can you unmute? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brandon, it's very nice to meet you. Um, I'm in North Carolina. Um, and there's a lot of, um, uh, mixed up stuff going on in our state as far as politics. But the question that I wanted to ask you has to do with my experience in starting um, many years ago, the National Organization for Women 
here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And as the feminist movement did a big culture change, uh, and it is still um, happening, it became a concern to me. And I'm also aware from having heard lectures um, on C-SPAN this past week about the role of men and boys in our society and how much of a struggle it is right now. And I see it, I hear about it, I know that it's happening. And my sense is that it is a barren place for males right now. And that makes me think that Christian nationalism could be a place for some respite for a male in terms of how they may recruit people. They're very much like terrorists in terms of the ways they recruit people. And I did see bad faith. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's right. I, it has amazed me um, that women are the majority in the population. So why would you want to run against women, which is exactly what the Republicans have done. Uh, but maybe they're following the Catholic model. I don't know. Uh, the Catholic Church is, every time it's had a change, change, choice to choose between women or patriarchy, it chose the pa patriarchy. It doesn't hesitate. So and it's worked for them. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, I yeah. I, I, I used to think. I, I mean. I keep saying I'm a historian. I really am. I have, I'm very uncomfortable in the modern world. I'd have been much more comfortable in the third or fourth century, <laughs> uh, except for the healthcare. But <laughs> the thing that uh, I, I came be, because of my wife came early under the influence of feminism and really saw it as a valuable thing, not as a threat. Uh, but the thing I always kept thinking when I was dealing with students is you can't change something that has been in place since caveman times in a generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're still fighting the battles of the Enlightenment, and mm -hmm. that's more than 200 years ago. I mean, they're still full on. Mm -hmm. We're running an election of whether or not we're going to invest in public health and science. I thought that was settled. <laughs> yeah. We could go back to a dark age. That's not impossible. Yeah. You know, so these things take, you're changing. I don't think it's genetic, but it, it's deep culture. You can't change deep culture. You know, yeah. I, th this is off the topic, but it's related. We have a, I don't want to give this away, but a, a local church here invited me to come. And just to attend the service, and they viewed themselves as being very liberal. And and the leader of the church, I don't call people pastors. Their minister wanted me to evaluate his sermon and what went, went on. And I gave him a list of things that I could not say or tolerate. Fairly easy to do. I, I didn't have to think about it very hard. Okay. A lot of slave language. And he said, well, there's no slave language in our community. Yeah, there is. You keep telling people, Lord, that's master slave. You know, people do it all. The, the elder got up and gave a sermon that you should have been lynched for. I mean, it was just <laughs> this to undo this stuff. It's really deep and you have to really think hard about it. And we, we've not we've not begun, I think, to really think for it because if you look at that trend line I put up, none is going up and they're going to keep going and the churches are, are, are going to go down or plateau. There's, there's no growth there. That's not going to happen. So logically, you would think if religion's got a future, it's going to be a, some kind of new religion. It's not going to be reforming one of the ones we've got. They've all are too invested in what was. And I... I think we might have to find something new. And Christian nationalism is making the bid to be the new. It's going to rebuild the world in a Christian image. 
That's that's his premise. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, I admire you for starting the. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a really great thing to do. You got something to be really proud about in your life. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Uh, Lillian, you want to unmute? Yes. Uh, very, very uh, uh, close to what you are all talking about is uh, uh, the fact that we need a good narrative. And the uh, we uh, the the Democratic Party does not have a good narrative that appeals. It our uh, our narrative appeals to reason. And at this point in this country, um, <laughs> the evangelicals and the nationalists use feelings to manipulate people. And until we find a good narrative that speaks to the mythological thinking of people. Like Martin Luther King, he's got a message. He, got, he created a new mythology about his vision and being on the mountaintop, and he inspired people. And we in the main line are afraid to say that because we were put in our place by the evangelicals and to not talk about politics in church, we don't want to lose people and it's based on fear and we don't uh, don't have a good narrative. I'm looking, I wish I could tell Kamala and Biden and so on, come on, come on, be, bring a, a good narrative that people can be inspired by, not just the word democracy, which is, interpretable and so um until we find a good narrative i i'm i'm a little discouraged okay that's it but i do say in my church like last sunday i have radical sermons and you know at my age i don't want to compromise so um uh, marianne knows i told my story about how Adam and Eve uh, are not the first names of two people who have lived who lived in the past and that they are concepts and so on and people said that makes sense mm -hmm. but most pastors do not have the courage okay done yeah I wrote a blog a couple of weeks ago the conclusion of which said if I have to choose between uh, Revelation and democracy, I'm choosing democracy. Nope. I don't understand why democracy is not an inspiring story. It's it's a great story. It's Authoritarianism a great story. is a terrible story. It's a terrible but Let's story. say it in an inspirational way, not just well, the word, you see. I will I mean, give Kamala Harris credit for the joy. For I the think joy. she did a really great job there. I'll give her credit for that. And I'm sure there were plenty of consultants telling you, you got to pounding. I think they're going to pound. We're getting down to the final time. There'll be a lot of fear on coming out of her campaign too, but. Okay. I, 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 don't, <laughs> I, I agree with you. I, I, I think the more for the problem you're getting at, the Democrats have a real problem because they're, they're trying to appeal to all these different groups. They always have. That's been the problem since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Re Republicans have always only appealed to one group. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. They've never had a, a pluralistic That's... vision, and they don't now. It may be a slightly different group, but it's still one group. It's still but, one group. Yeah. yeah. The, Thank we, you. The Democrats have always had that problem. There's just, you know, Will Rogers once said, I don't belong to any organized party. I'm a Democrat. So. <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. I, I live think... in Oklahoma. Will Rogers is the big. He was born <laughs> just right down the street from here. So <laughs> you have to quote from Will Rogers if you're in Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> comment is I keep explaining to people that the word politics is not about partisan politics. No. It's a 
it's from polis, which means city, which means how do we live together? Yeah, and Aristotle that, defines politics as the art of living together in the city. The art of living together, and that right. is poly and consequently we are all political. Right. Uh, so anyway, in fact, he Aristotle is interesting here because he de he identifies he defines a human being. This is anti-Plato. Plato defines the human being as an essence, as a divine essence. What yes. Plato sees as the divine spark. Aristotle yeah. rejects that, which in Christianity becomes the soul. Okay, man, that's how that transfer works out. Yeah. Aristotle defines humans as a, and this is a slap at Plato, as a political animal. Ah, I didn't An know Animal that. who lives in the city. Ah. Mm -hmm. So Excellent. he makes that togetherness fundamental to what the human person is in Aristotle's knowledge. It's, it's, and he's, he's, he's attacking the essentialism of Plato in that definition. Excellent. Thank you. I'll share that with my congregation. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lily. Okay. Marianne, we have time for one more. Um, I think one more, and then I, I have a brief close. And then we will have, uh, for those who can, we're going to have a coffee time. And Brandon, you'll be with us for that. Yeah. And and, um, and I don't drink coffee, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I'm a tea drinker. So it's just a euphemism. And we'll, um, if, for those who can stay for coffee time, we will take more questions during, during that 15, 20 minutes. Okay. And um, uh, so, uh, but we'll take one more and then I'll, I have a brief close and, and right. then we'll, we'll have closing music and coffee time. So the, the next person, um, the name that is on their video is subscriber. So I don't know who you are. Uh, subscriber iPad TFP. Can you un unmute yourself? Right, here we go. And it, we need yeah. to... We need to. If you can unmute right now, that would be super. Yeah. He did it. There we go. There we go. No, nope, he read, undid it. Oh, uh, yeah, you're you're still unmuted. You know what? Maybe we can encourage no, you. No, no, no. Uh, okay, go I, ahead. I can talk later. No, go I'm ahead. Dick Neely. I'm, I'm Dick Neely, Brandon. Brandon. Right. <clears throat> I'm a retired officer in the Presbyterian Church USA. And so I'm mainline. I want to thank you for one thing in particular you said, and that was the reason we can't have a conversation with nationalist, conservatives, fundamentalists, is because they don't believe in science. They don't believe in science. The light bulb for me is one that you also had said earlier, and that is that we've never really come to terms with the enlightenment. And I don't think that's just the fundamentalist. That's I think everybody. that's true. I, I think it's just mainline. And, and, I, and I sense a vocation, 80 years old, to do something to say to the mainline, the, those of us in my, where I live, and we've got to start asking questions. We've got to start encouraging curiosity. We've got to start complimenting skepticism as a means toward integrity, as a means toward some growth and some change. I thank you for that statement. I just wanted to say that. Mm. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Um, in closing, I, uh, a couple things. Uh, our next second Saturday conversation will be November 9th. That'll be after the election. Um, and we are going to have our first third Saturday of the year, and that'll be November 16th. I will be sending out an invitation. Third Saturdays are an opportunity for small group reflection. So it's not everybody's cup of tea, but we want to give people an opportunity to be in small groups and, and we'll give some prompts. It'll probably be somewhat related to what has, uh, what are, what, is, what has happened uh, with the election. So November 9th is the next second Saturday. November 16th will be a third Saturday. Make note of that for those who want to be part of that. Um, the closing music for today, um, I'm having Cab Calloway sing It Ain't Necessarily So. And um, 
I, uh, Cab Calloway's dates are 1907 to 1994. He was a, uh, uh, he, he was a performer of the Cotton Club. He was a master of energetic, energetic scat singing. You'll hear a little bit of that. Um, he was a band leader. He's, um, he, and I actually heard Cab Calloway. He came to uh, Sleepy Hollow High School in Terrytown, New York. I was a freshman and he came and did a performance and I was just dazzled by his uh, expressiveness. And I mean, his hands blossomed like flowers and he was amazing. So anyway, Cab Calloway uh, will be singing It Ain't Necessarily So. Um, our closing, um, I want to close today with a poem by Langston Hughes. Uh, his dates are 1901 to 1967. He's an, he was an American poet, a social activist, a novelist, a playwright, a significant figure in the Harlem Renaissance. And um, I, I want to read Hughes's poem, which is titled Democracy. And that will be our close. And then for those who can, I'll see you at coffee time with Brandon. And um, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, Brandon, thank you for helping to educate us. And um, we'll, we will continue this conversation, but I'm really honored that you were here and with us. We need you, we needed you. Thank you, Brandon. Democracy by Langston Hughes. And as I said, he wrote this in 1949. Democracy will not come today, this year, nor ever through compromise and fear. I have as much right as the other fellow has to stand on my two feet and own the land. I tire so of hearing people say, let things take their course. Tomorrow is another day. I do not need my freedom when I'm dead. I cannot live on tomorrow's bread. Freedom is a strong seed planted in a great need. I live here too. I want freedom, just as you. Thank you again for being with us today. And vote, vote.